Good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar. Tonight we're going to be looking at GDPR one month in. Uh, we've, we've all been tackling it for a month now and we're going to be hopefully answering some of the frequently asked questions that we've been receiving here at Urban and uh, they've been receiving at the NLA as well. Um, I'm joined tonight by the lovely Richard Blanco. Hello, good evening. Uh, who is back by popular demand <laughs> um, after the past couple of webinars he's done with us. And so he's going to be chatting with me tonight about the uh, about GDPR and I'll pass over to Richard to introduce himself. Okay, well uh, I am one of the local representatives at the National Landlords Association. I'm a London based landlord and I've got properties in North East and South East London, so across six London boroughs, which is handy for trying to understand this multi multiplicity of licensing schemes and various bureaucracies that <laughs> local authorities it's put in place. Huge. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I do lots of press work as well with the NLA, so you might have seen me on Victoria Derbyshire and things like that, so I'm always happy to help out with that kind of stuff. And I also represent... Um, a uh, show in America called House Hunters International, which is lots of fun with American couples coming over to the UK and me trying to find them a property. So, um, well versed to uh, talk about all this sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, and uh, you know, uh, I think the great thing about all of the reps actually is we are busy landlords ourselves and we're constantly checking tenants in and checking them out and you know, dealing with agents and dealing with things like GDPR, having to know what you're up to. So, the perfect person. <laughs> to go through these awkward questions with us tonight. I will do my best, Polly. <laughs> <Brace yourself. clears throat> right, so the, we're going to touch on just some general GDPR questions initially. I mean, there's been a, a huge amount coming in. We've, we've been receiving them at, at Urban and the Landlord University, and I know that the advice line at the NLA have been, have been getting a load as well. Um, I think the, the, the first one that, that I've certainly received most of at, at events and, and over the phone is I'm a small landlord. I've just got one property. I, I just have one set of tenants that come in and one that goes out. Does all this apply to me? Is this is this relevant to me or, or can I bury my head in the sand with it? It certainly does. You're a business dealing with individuals' data and therefore you are a data controller. So GDPR does apply to you. Uh, so yes, absolutely. So whether you're a small landlord or you've got 100 properties or you're a, a housing association... Unfortunately, it's it's going to be the same across the board. Absolutely, you know, the data we're dealing with, of course, are names and addresses and referencing information and all of that kind of stuff. That's just bread and butter stuff for landlords. I mean, landlords do have some quite delicate information, really, don't they? <laughs> I was thinking about this yesterday. I've just had some tenants move into my Walthamstow house, and I know what all three of them earn. You know, and that's it's, quite it's sen unusual, that it? sensitive information that you know I, I, they they wouldn't want to be just bandied around. So you know, I need to be careful with that. Okie dokie. So uh, something else that crops up quite a lot, and I can understand this one. It's a, uh, it, it's difficult to get your head around, I think. But a lot of people are asking, um, are my tenants? obligated to comply with GDPR to, con to, to protect your data. As a landlord, it's, it's understandable to, to, be, to be worrying about that. Now, no, tenants aren't, because GDPR only applies to businesses that are handling individuals' data. So, obviously, tenants are not a business. They're your customer. They're an individual that's, um, who, whose data you're holding. So, no, it doesn't work the other way around. And I think there's a bit of confusion with that. If you've got a tenant who is a business and, and is running a business, it's... I, I mean, some people work. There's a lot of people working from home nowadays, and that's certain. If you're if you're happy with your tenant running a business from your property, even in that instance, they are still not a business that's handling your data. They are still a customer. They are still the consumer in in your relationship. It's about you know who is the data controller. The landlord is the data controller. The tenant is an individual that we're dealing with, and they're your customer, not vice versa, and therefore. Um, they're not subject to GDPR in, for the sake of your relationship. They might be subject to GDPR for all the other stuff they're doing they'll in relation to their business. Yes, <laughs> they may well do. Yes, it's it's likely, I, I suppose, that most in most jobs, certainly. I mean, myself, I, I'm, I'm working in marketing, and, and you as the landlord, we, we we both understand GDPR. We're coming across it in our in our day to day lives. But I, I would say most tenants now, having seen it on the news and dealing with it at work will be aware of it 
So it's not. This isn't going to be a shock anymore. The myriad it? of emails that have been plopping yes, into our inboxes well. <laughs> have been driving landlords and tenants mad. Yeah, Everybody they're still coming through, aren't they? So I think. Uh, uh, you know, everyone's aware that GDPR is happening. Mm. And heartily sick of it, I would imagine. <laughs> um, so we know it's an EU regulation, and it's one of the uh, the three regulations that are Brexit proof. So it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but it doesn't. It's not. It's not something that only applies to EU citizens, is it? It's not something that we have to be. Um, obviously, we will do the right to rent checks, but we don't have to look at the right to rent checks and say, oh, this, is, this person isn't from the EU, so I don't have to apply GDPR to them. No, it applies to all citizens that come into the EU for whatever reason, um, but it does apply to all EU businesses. So, um, you know, EU businesses that might be operating outside of the EU will still be subject to GDPR. So basically, it's all the EU businesses and all EU citizens. Perfect. And, of course... Under EU citizens, and that brings us neatly on to some guarantors. Um, we're, we're talking a lot about tenants, of course, but the, the rules still apply for guarantors, don't they? That's a question that's cropping up a lot. They do. I mean, whenever I get a guarantor for an AST, you know, a, a, a short shorthold tenancy, uh, I will reference the guarantor just as I might a tenant. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be handling the same level of data. Um, so therefore, they're also subject to GDPR. I mean, you, you possibly wouldn't even think about a guarantor. It's just it's second nature, isn't it? But you'd still have to send them a privacy policy and do all the same, go through all the same boxes and tick all the same boxes off to, to with the guarantor as well as the tenant. Absolutely, yes, yeah. So uh, one of the things that we've um, the NLA have certainly mentioned um, that I understand that they're deleting a lot of the documentation um, that they currently hold, um, or I believe it's now been deleted, it's, it's it has, gone, yes. isn't it? Um, whereas a lot of other online companies are still holding that data. Um, is there a reason as to why the NLA have chosen to, to, to get rid of the data that they hold? Yes, one of the issues was that a lot of the data was a short shorthold tenancies that landlords had created using the template, mm-hmm. the online template, and those tenants hadn't given consent okay. for those uh, ASTs to be held by the NLA. So it would have been a massive job to go back to all of those tenants and say, is it okay for us to keep this on file? And that's why they've all been deleted. But, I mean, members were given plenty of notice, mm-hmm. and I always download them anyway, I'm sure. Well, members you would assume would. that you're, mm. you're going to have a copy of your own AST. And, yes. And if you've sent it then to your tenant, chance so you sent it by email, or so you would probably have a digital copy yourself. It was handy having it on the system because you could duplicate it if you're renewing the contract the next yeah. year. You could duplicate it, and then you could just change the dates and so on so sadly we haven't got that facility now but I, I understand they are working on it so that hopefully it will be up and running again I mean we are only a month in I mean I dare say that now now the regulations are in and they're likely to be be staying in and then they're not going anywhere are they they might be adapted in time but I think they're, they're in and they're likely to be as they are for some time businesses like the NLA organizations like the NLA can adapt their procedures and their policies to suit the new the new regulations really they're going to have to there's been a huge amount of change already and I dare say that will just continue as we work out more how it's going to work for various organizations so yeah. watch this space I guess yes absolutely <laughs> yes yeah we're all adapting gradually I guess really. it's, a, it's a good team team here at the MLA so I'm sure they'll have that in hand and know what they're up to So I think by now we've all got an understanding of GD of what GDPR is and and how it affects us and I think we're all accepting that it is affecting us <laughs> that we have to we have to have a look at this. Um, so the documentation one one of the, the the really big questions that I think everybody's been asking and trying to Google and, and find online um, and one of the questions that we certainly get asked an awful lot is what are the exact documents that I require. To comply as a landlord, what do I need to comply? Um, and, and there's a few, isn't there? There's a, there's a few documents that you you need to get get sorted to 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 get compliant. Yes, I mean the first one really is a fair processing notice, and uh, that might sound a bit scary, but don't worry because there is an NLA guide that mm-hmm. NLA members can access, and it does have a model fair processing notice in it, and you can also download that from the website and then amend it to suit your circumstances. Like the pro forma tenancy agreement, so the same sort of. 
principle. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. So you just, um, I spent, I think it took me an hour to just go through it and just amend it and put some extra bits in. And I've started now giving that to my tenants. Um, the next available time that I contact them, I send it through to them. Okay. Um, um, I think one of the key things that I picked up from the guide was the lawful bases on which you can uh, process data. And there are six. The three that I'm most interested in, really, for me as a landlord, um, there's the contract uh, lawful basis. So the fact there's a contract between me and the tenant means that I therefore have to process their data mm -hmm. because of that contract. Um, so, for example, um, it says in the contract that the tenant is responsible for gas and electricity uh, whilst they're living in the property. So when I contact the utility company and say, I've now moved out and the tenant's moved in, I think it's lawful for me to say, and these are the names of the tenants, because it's part of um, the contract that they're going to be paying the, the electricity and gas. So that's an example of where contract might be the lawful basis. Um, the second one is legal obligation. So, for example, the gas safety certificate's a legal obligation, and by law we have to hold that for two years. And also right to rent checks, of course, are a legal obligation, so that's data we have to collect for that. And we must keep a copy of the passport for a year after the tenant has moved out. So. Um, the, the law requires us to do that, and that's a lawful basis there. And then the legitimate interest is a bit of catch-all. Um, we have to balance the needs of the data protector, that's me as the landlord, with the uh, those of the individual, the interests of the individual. Now, an example of this is the tenant calls me up and says, help, there's a leak in the ceiling. <laughs> um, they clearly want the leak to be sorted it's out. Something they're going to want doing, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So, you know, it, it's then it, it, in their legitimate interest for me to give their details to the contractor so the contractor can go out and carry out the repair. So, um, now, you know, an example of where that wouldn't be acceptable is where my gas safety guy said, do you mind if I email all of your tenants because I'm trying to flock some new boilers? <laughs> or, you know, uh, now that wouldn't be in their legitimate interest because mm -hmm. they've not requested that. So, you know, that would be a misuse of data. Um, so th those are the three that I would tend to use. Some people might use consent as well. I've heard of some landlords using that. Mm -hmm. But obviously, uh, it's for you to look at the NLA guide and decide which of those lawful bases um, work for you. It's quite a nice way to do it. If you, if you can actually write down every step you take from, from advertising your property to the tenant actually moving out, the, the day they move out and every process that happens from, from advertising to viewing to the right to rent check, referencing, everybody's process is completely different, isn't it? Your, I think yours it's a would great be different idea. to mine. Mm. And and, and write, the, write the steps down and then try and use the guide and, and match the best process to the, the legal basis that makes most sense. Yes, in effect, it, it's the letting cycle, isn't it? Exactly. We're saying which bit of the letting cycle relates to which bit yeah. of the, of which lawful basis. Um, the other documents that you need are a storage policy. So I would have thought that most landlords, I'm probably quite a typical example, will have a paper folder. I have a paper folder for... The shoebox in the loft. <laughs> uh, yes, well, well, I have one for each property. I have... Um, you know, an office at home where I keep all of those. Um, they're within a residential uh, premises, so, you know, I don't have external third parties coming in to access them. So I would suggest that that is secure. I don't, I mean, if they're in an office where there are other people coming and going, then I think they should probably be in a locked filing cabinet to make sure that other people can't access them. Um, and then also you have to decide how long you're going to keep this data for. Now, HMRC, of course, requires to keep some data for six months, uh, sorry, six years. So I would recommend with ASTs, we keep those for six years and then get rid of them. Um, and um, other things like our safety certificates, we have to keep for a, a, a two years. Um, so basically you need to go through all of your documents and decide how long you should be keeping them for. Is it... Uh, I I mean, with regards to, um, I mean, how long we hold personal data for is a question we get asked an awful lot. I, I'm erring on the side of, of having a standardised data holding length, as it were. So whether it's whether you're holding a, a gas safety certificate for that bit longer than you may have to, um, so it falls in line with the length of time that you'd want to hold a, a, a accounts for, 
rather than having to say, oh, I've, I've, it's, I've been holding this, uh, this right to rent check for a year, so I must get rid of it, or I, I, I want to hold this tenancy agreement for six years after the end of the contract. So I, my, my feeling would be possibly have, have one, one length of time that you hold data for, irregardless of what that data is, just to make your life as as simple as possible. I agree, and then basically that file after X years is, know, is, is, is deleted, yeah. destroyed, obviously securely. Um, I agree with that. I mean, the way I test this is I think, you know, if a tenant made an access request years after they'd moved out mm -hmm. and said, you know, I would like to see all of the information you hold on me with my name on it, um, would I feel comfortable with the level of data that I hold on them? Or would I feel mightily embarrassed, you know, that it was 13 years ago and I've still got it? So I think that's probably quite a good test. I am I mean, each landlord needs to make up their minds really individually. It's not for the NLA to prescribe this. But I'm relatively comfortable with that six-year um, time scale, uh, but just because you know something might come up in the accounts, HMRC might want to see stuff. Um, so uh, you know that's that works for me, but of course it's for individual landlords to see what works for them. And it's something that if you're if you're going to create a policy about it, again, it's something that you need to be able to stick to, isn't it? It's mm. uh, if you say you're only going to hold data for for six years, you need to make sure you are getting a shot of it after six years, and yes. and that you are or that you are keeping it for the required six years. So if you've got a policy saying you'll hold data for six years, you can't think, oh, I'm, I'm going to have a clear out and, and get rid of it after a year and a half. Consistency is important, isn't it? If that it subject really access is. request does come in, then you have to be able to deliver the, deliver the information. And don't be a hoarder. I'm sure some <laughs> of us kind of can't throw anything away. Yeah. <laughs> I did spot a gas safety certificate from 2003 the other day. So <laughs> as I was clearing stuff out pre-GDPR. Um, I mean, we're only supposed to hold data for as long as you have a legitimate requirement to do so. I struggle a little bit with, say, reference checks, um, because there is some data on there that I would like to keep whilst the tenants are with me. For example, their bank account details, just in case they do default and I have to take them to court and then mm -hmm. need to take enforcement action and want to freeze their bank account. I've not had to do it with a tenant, you know, but who knows, one day I might need to, then actually having their bank account details would be very useful. So, you know, I, I need to argue then in my policy that that's a legitimate requirement and it may be that I just keep that bit of their referencing check and everything else gets destroyed. If, you, if you've got a policy that, that lays out clearly what you are planning to do, as long as you're clear and transparent, you're, you're clear and transparent. People can't argue if they, if they approve it, then... The other thing to bear in mind is the more data you hold, the more susceptible you are to some sort of incident <laughs> where more data can get into the wrong hands. The more you so, hold and the older it is, it's, yes, uh, and the of, riskier it is. So that's something to bear in mind. And obviously it needs to be kept securely. So, uh, you know, it should be behind a password if it's on uh, digital um, appliances. And, you know, that can be computers and smartphones, of course, etc. Their computers themselves now, aren't they really? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. So we've we've looked at sort of the the documents that you you need, um, something that I'm, I'm sure the NLA get asked as often as we do. Um, if if you're using an agent, um, be it a letting agent or a managing agent, do you need to have all this documentation in place? Is it something that's necessary for you to worry about? Yeah, I mean, I would turn this question on its head a bit, really, because I think. You know, say you're a super busy person, you've got three children at home and you just haven't got time to deal with tenants, so you've handed all of the management over to an agent. I would still say to you that that relationship between landlord and, and tenant is a very valuable asset in your business. So I think you still need to know stuff about your tenants, um, you know, a little bit about who they are and, and so on. And I think you certainly need to see the references and if you're going to see the references then you, you, you are the a data controller even if you're just seeing them for an hour you know uh, so you still are handling data and I think you still need a fair processing notice. I think it's quite quite often this this question comes up when when I'm in, in meetings with people and, and, and they say well I I use a managing agent they they look after the property I, I pass them the keys and and, and that's that. You say, okay, well, do you know your tenant's name? 
well, yeah, I, I, I know their name. You say, well, you've got their name and their address. So you, you hold identifying, identifying data on that person. Well, the other thing I would say, Polly, just in terms of good practice as a landlord, um, you know, if the tenant doesn't know who you are and has never met you, I, I wonder if they're less likely to look after the property. I wonder if they're sort mm. of, you know, would be more likely to go into arrears because there's no personal interaction there. Mm. And I think that personal interaction is important. I'm not in, not saying that, you know, you have to be managing all the repairs and so on, but I think some measure of personal interaction is important. Just isn't a, a face to the name. And even if you just know their names, as you say, you're still handling data. So the uh, the final question in this sort of this section, in the policy section, is um, that we've been asked by a couple of people to, to go through a fair processing notice or privacy policy um, line by line. Um, I, I will. In, this we are going to do this, and this will be in the in the membership area of the NLA. Um, it's it's not something that we we wanted to include on the webinar tonight. If we if we did that here tonight, we'd uh, we'd be here until until midnight, I think, because they're they're fairly hefty documents. So. I, I will be going through this later, um, and uh, I'll, I'll upload a recording of, of me doing so um, into the, the membership area of the NLA, so you'll be able to listen to that whilst you're looking at the document itself. So. Okay, so we are getting prepared for, for finding our new tenants and, and knowing what we're having to do there. So we, we touched on the, the shoebox in the loft. I'm, I'm showing my filing system here, and I'm being very transparent. Um, some, a lot of people have been asking us um, recently whether or not all the documentation that they're pulling together in preparation for finding tenants, um, whether they should be supplying that pack of information to existing and past tenants. And, and you mentioned that you're, you've downloaded the policy and you've obviously um, made that work for you, and then you've been giving it to tenants as and when you've you've been in contact with them. So is that is that the way to be doing it? Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, I checked in a tenant in May into one of my houses and now, you know, I give them the deposit protection certificate, the gas age certificate, all those documents you have to give at the start of a tenancy and the fair processing notice and I explain that to them and say, if you've got any questions, let me know. So and that, that then goes into the tenant's handbook, which is a file that I keep or they keep in the property. So yes, absolutely, giving it to new tenants and also giving it to existing tenants. I'm actually waiting until I get in touch with them about something because I don't want to add the whole kind of avalanche of GDPR <laughs> notices they're together. getting from everyone. So just the next time I get in touch, I'm saying, oh, and by the way, here's my fair processing notice. If you've got any questions, do let me know. I suppose they can approach you and ask for it, can't they? If they if they wanted to, you do have one. It's ready. It's there. Yes. I mean, so, I'm slightly worrying that maybe I'm not compliant because they should have had it on the 25th of May. But I just think I, I, I would rather... Um, I, they had it in a way in which they can engage with it rather than just you know another one that's coming into their uh, email. I think the, the emails are starting to starting to slow down a little bit now, yes. aren't they? It's, um, <laughs> it's taken a month, but they're they're starting to slow down a bit. But I think that it's it's quite wise to actually wait and and make sure that they appreciate what it is and what it means. And if they've got any questions, obviously they can then. And go I, I have some issues with tenants who don't speak very much English. English is their second language, um, so there are issues there with you know um, they. Uh, sort of having verbal discussions or just explaining it a mm. bit with people and also um, some tenants who find it a bit scary and wondering what it means and does that mean that the tenancy is coming to an end or something I've, you know I've had one tenant that thought that that meant that something was happening so it was at the a end of the tenancy yes yes yeah. so um, just be careful how it lands on their doorstep or in their email box and, and you know you might need to explain it a bit we have had a few people mention that they don't want to supply anything to existing tenants that they have to sign or notify that they've received or anything because there is that concern that it does look like they are going to be making changes to the price of rent or that they're going to be paying I think the word notice or... worries people yeah. and processing is a bit alien to some people. Um, so... You know, they probably see the word fair, but then they see the word processing and notice and think... <laughs> it's a hefty document, isn't it? it yes. It, it was, mm. It's something, it's like the sort of the small print you get with your insurance. It always comes through and you look and go, oh, this is and looks it's, quite, quite scary. There's quite a bit of legalese in it. Absolutely. You know, there has to be, so yes. 
So it's uh, again just to just to mention that the document is all available within the membership section of the NLA website. Um, if you're not a member, all the details are available online. But um, I should stress that they, they can look really scary. This one is fairly fairly simple to understand, and it, it shouldn't be quite as as scary for your tenants. Yeah, um, and you just need to go through you, it, and it exactly. says I, me, us, those sorts of things. So you just need to change those bits in it. Um, I think they've worked quite hard to make it not scary as, as, as approachable as possible. as I said it took me an hour to go through it and I needed to add a few bits and bobs in it but uh, you know it's now done and dusted and it will be done and it's not like a tenancy agreement where it will have to be changed upon every uh, every tenancy it's it once you've changed it and you've made those changes it's done isn't it it's an hour exactly. and that's it I've saved it in my GDPR folder, Compliant folder. <laughs> <laughs> and it's there to send to tenants as and when is it's that needed. folder password protected oh it certainly is there you go. <laughs> that's, that's good to hear um this one I think we've kind of we've kind of touched on this question really um Someone's asked, uh, my properties have always been managed by letting agents, but I've retained copies of all the ASTs. What what do I do then? P presumably it's a comply, comply, comply. Yes, I mean, you are um, a data controller because you've got those ASTs, they contain data about the tenants, so yes, you need to comply. I think we've, I think we've touched on that one and that made that one quite clear, haven't we? Um, th this one's a, a bit of an unusual one. I think one of the, one of the issues we had... Um, in the sort of the, the lead up to GDPR was that we were all playing on the same level playing field as companies like Barclays and NatWest and Marks and Spencers and Facebook. They, there was nothing in the legislation, that, the, the regulation that geared towards landlords. And so there were certain things that landlords have to do that directly <laughs> went against the regulations or seemed to go directly against the regulations um, and one of those things that someone's brought up here is um, that they've had to provide their forwarding address of their tenant to their deposit scheme now uh, whether this will whether the deposit schemes will change this theory or whether the regulations will be adapted to suit different different types of businesses I, I don't know, we, we don't know yet There's, <laughs> we're a month in but and um, what what would what would you think would be the way around this in, I, the, in the short mm, term? I actually think this is a consent issue. So what I do um, three or four weeks before my tenants moving out, I send them a checkout letter which says, you know, just confirming this is the date you're moving out and this is the time and etc. And one of the sections in that letter says about them giving me their forwarding address. So. If you'd like me to forward mail to you, if you'd like me to inform utilities, etc., please provide me with your forwarding address. So uh, they then have the option to do that if, if they wish to do that, and uh, and they are then giving consent for me to, to provide it to somebody like uh, the Deposit Protection Scheme. I think if they haven't given consent, then you're probably in a tricky situation mm -hmm. and it's probably better to ask the tenant to provide the forwarding address to the scheme. What I often do with my deposits, because it does ask you for an alternative address, is I actually uh, just put the name of the agent that found them for me if it's a mm -hmm. tenant find. So that's one way, of, you know, if the, rather if the agent just did a tenant find for me at the start, that's one way of dealing with it. I think my deposits doesn't kind of, does not, compute unless no, you put an address in there. To, I, I think so, a, lot of, a couple of them are, are like that. I'm afraid I have put in the address where the tenant used to live, which is the one that they, they gave me at the start. So I, th um, I think the, the deposit hmm. schemes will probably realise that they're that there potentially is an issue there. Mm. Um, but as I say, we're so early on in the in the situation. It's uh, and if, if there, there are people, if there are enough complaints and people saying that consent is difficult to get, or mm. um, I mean, when you're moving out of a property, there's huge amounts of paperwork to do, isn't there? And if that one thing is missed, and it delays the deposit process, and I think people will start to potentially complain and have issues with that. So I, I wonder if that may be something we will see change in the future. Yes, I mean, I'm starting to wonder actually now if I need a consent form that says, you know, are you willing to give me your forwarding address so that I can forward letters to you and give the forwarding address to utility companies, etc. Um, so I, that's something I need to clarify for myself, whether I need them to sign an actual form 
or or whether if I put it in my checkout letter and then they they then give me their address in, in response to the checkout letter that could be implied consent but of course it's always better to get a signed document isn't it yeah or a response mm. to an email or something along mm. those lines is always a, a, a nice idea you, you can always it, it gives you a definite yes then, yes it? are you happy with me yes. giving your forwarding address to mm-hmm. utility companies and to my deposits and if they come back and say yes here it is then you've got consent. And I think if you can give them an alternative and you can say, if, if you're not happy, you are, you as the tenant can supply the information directly to the scheme if you prefer, then really there's, you, you're giving every option, aren't you? Mm, yes, yeah. So uh, in answer to that question then, so uh, try and gain consent and if they're not prepared to, to give you consent on that one, then do give them the opportunity to supply the information themselves directly and watch this space and see if, the situation changes because it, it may well do. Yes, I mean, there could be an argument that it's legitimate interest to supply the forwarding address, but I think you're on... Uh, Potentially dodgy ground. Yeah, I that think one, so I as well, say. yes. If you had to justify it to a judge, it mm. might be a bit of a, a tricky one to, to I agree, around. I think that's one way you do need consent, yeah. So, we as a... Uh, or you as landlords are, uh, are now doing everything you can possibly do. As data controllers, you are up to speed and, um, and you know what you're doing and how you're doing it. But your, your processes are a different matter, aren't they? They are the, uh, the potential, potential issue for a lot of people. And I think there's a lot of confusion about when you really need to take control on what your processes are up to and, and how how much of an impact they actually can have on, on you as, and your business. Um, especially the, the smaller processes. I think a lot of people understand that your letting agent, your managing agent, is someone that you've kind of got to keep an eye on and, and understand that their policies are compliant. Um, but that said, do you actually have a responsibility to make sure that they're compliant? You do. As the data controller, you shouldn't be handing on data to somebody who is not kind of trustworthy, if you like, i.e. they should also be compliant. And the way that they show you that they're compliant is by sending you their fair processing notice um, and policies so that you can see they're holding data securely, etc. And of course, um, agents will, will handle a lot of data. I mean, they might be managing 600 properties. That could be 2,000 individuals that are housed in those 600 properties. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of data, that's a serious matter, and they need, you know, they're also handling keys and stuff like that. So they've got to have really robust processes in place. Um, all of that stuff that they're getting in referencing as well, you know, all of that sensitive personal data about CCJs and how much people earn and, you know, all, all the potential for identity theft and so on, if you think about it. So it's really important that you only... Uh, hand data over to other data controllers who are who, you trust. who are uh, trustworthy and compliant. Yes. In the NLA, have got their accredited supplier scheme, haven't they? The, I mean, they we at Urban Web were one of the accredited suppliers, um, and I understand. We I, I certainly remember we went through quite a heavy vetting process. I think everybody Absolutely, does to, yeah. to be a, an NLA accredited supplier, um, and I would. I would hazard a guess that if you're unsure, if you need a supplier, if, you, if you're looking for a contractor or a processor of any, that they, I know they certainly have a, a wide variety of, of organisations on there covering everything you could possibly need as a landlord. Um, and I would, I would hazard a guess that you'd probably get a, a compliance supplier from, from that bunch there somewhere. So. Yes, but I mean, we've, we've got to start getting confident about saying, could you please send me your fair processing notice or your privacy policy? Absolutely. Policy. You know, that's, we need to be asking that of all of the people that we work with now, really. A lot of them are available online as well. It's, uh, have a look on the, on the website of the company that you're thinking of using and, and just check if it's something that you feel actually does cut the mustard if it's something that looks looks like it should look and looks the sort of have a read through and make sure it sounds like you want it to sound it's it is a, 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 a ours is certainly quite a hefty document it's mm. uh, as you say we handle as a letting agent we handle a huge amount of data so ours is a, a fairly large 
um, large policy as you'd expect mm. um, and I would hope that everyone would be able to have a look and feel confident that we know what we're up to yes. and, uh, yeah. so so do check online and just check that the company that you're using has, has a policy and if they don't give them a call and they should be happy to send it on to you and no questions asked mm-hmm. Absolutely so your your letting agent, your managing agent, the sort of the, the bigger organisation, your referencing agent, um, they obviously you would hope are going to be compliant. Um, I think some of the trouble comes and some of the confusion is certainly coming from um, the sort of the one man band companies. And we use that, a lot of them. As yeah, absolutely, yes, yeah. um, occasional maintenance, the plumbers, the electricians, um, and people are asking um, whether they have to be GDPR compliant. Um, I mean, they're businesses, so you The answer is them. yes, absolutely. And I mean, there is a challenge here. If I think about my trusty builder, whom I love very much, and he's very good <laughs> so at his job. difficult to come by. But he's rubbish at admin, and he would admit that. You know, his filing cabinet is, uh, you know, his van. <laughs> <laughs> and I worry what happens to any piece of paper that finds its way into there. Mm-hmm. I, do, I have mentioned GDPR to him, and he's definitely going to need a helping hand with that. So um, I'm going to see if we can adapt the... The NLA fair processing notice for him. The issue here is, you know, um, I give him um, all of my tenants' phone numbers and he has keys to all of the properties as well. So obviously I trust him with that. Um, I don't give it to him on a piece of paper because I don't trust him with not being able to lose that, etc. <laughs> so he's got it on, I use Dropbox and he can get it on his phone. Mm-hmm. And he can also just press on the phone number and it calls the tenant so he doesn't have to put it into his contacts or anything. Okay. So I, that's one way that I help him to keep that data secure because obviously his phone is password protected. Um, there are risks here. I mean, you imagine uh, the your builder has tenant's phone number, they leave it lying around, they go over to the property to do some work with a labourer, the labourer fancies one of the tenants, they can see their phone number on the list, they then stop texting the tenant and uh, harassing them even, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are risks there. That's n- for, no, never happened to me, but it could happen, of course. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you would then be responsible for that breach of data. So we need to help the sort of one-man band traders, probably, not all of them, of course, but some of them, to, to become compliant. And it's, I, I think there's... I mean, with with landlords, there's, a, there's, there's things like this. There's, there's webinars, there's a lot of CPD, there's all that sort of thing. It's, a, it's become a very much more online focus. It's a, a lot more sort of sharing and, and talking and the landlord meetings, the NLA, that sort of thing. But I doubt very much GDPR is going to be the topic of conversation between plumbers on their tea break and that sort of thing. So it's 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 quite it's quite likely that this may have passed a lot of people by. Um they I know certainly I've deleted a huge amount of the emails and thought this is brilliant. I'm gonna be clearing up my inbox completely. Mm. But if I wasn't embedded within this within my working life it's it's possible that I wouldn't really understand it at all certainly not the impact that it would have on me as a business so it's it's, it's actually quite tricky to broach as well because mm -hmm. it's not something that interests neither my plumber nor (laughs) my builder um and you know my builder is quite resistant to it actually Um, understandably yes understandably and I think it's going to be a question of me creating this fair processing notice for him. Interestingly, another contractor has asked him for it. So, uh, you know, that's he's starting to realise that it's becoming important. So it's it, I, one question that we've got down here is if my, if my plumber doesn't have a fair processing notice, am I no longer allowed to use them? I, I don't think it's really a case of you're not allowed to use them, but it, it does put you at risk, doesn't it? It does, yes. Um, I mean... I would want to kind of interview, really, my plumber to say, how do you keep data securely? Um, I I need um, need to know about your procedures, what you do with phone numbers, etc. My plumber has, he's a classic plumber, who who, has his wife doing the admin. And I know she's very efficient and, you know, that they're very careful with data. And and, um, so I'm reassured by all of that. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, my builder is more likely bits of paper lying around all over the place. So, you know, you have to take a view on that and how comfortable you are with that. It's just having that reassurance and, and being confident in 
in the situation yourself. And and as you said, if, if there's if there's any way you can help, if, if you've spent the time doing the privacy policy and, and getting hold of it from the NLA and and then why not why not consider sharing it? It's yes, and I need to coach my builder, for example, around paperwork and you know, I discourage him from using paperwork. I mean he doesn't like paperwork. So as I say, we use Dropbox and, you know, I need to make him aware that if he's got paperwork with people's names and numbers on, he needs to be careful with that. And I often give him folders with labels on and things like that to help him with his admin. Um, and, you know, it's because it's because builders work in a sort of slightly different world from us, don't they? And, you know, they spend half the day covered in cement and stuff, you know, and they can't. I know from when I've kind of helped out as a bit of a labour and done stuff on building sites, you, you're just not in that mode to deal with office and paperwork. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, so it's about helping them out, really, with that stuff. It's knowing knowing your skills and, and capitalising on helping each other. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, in many ways we work in partnership with our tradespeople, so... Uh, yes. We all know how difficult it is to find good tradespeople, so yeah. do whatever you can so to keep them and, that's and make sure that's another webinar, Polly. That's a whole other <laughs> webinar, absolutely, and one that would probably be very popular. Yes. <laughs> how do I find a good plumber? Just, uh, right. Okay, so we're we're nearly there. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight, by the way. Thank you for My answering pleasure. all the questions. Um, so, the, the, final, the final hurdle with GDPR, I think, and this is one that has left a few of us scratching our heads <laughs> for the past couple of months, is, um, is understanding the ICO, um, the Information Commissioner's Office, who are kind of the governing body of data in the UK. Um, understandably, they've been a bit swamped, I think, over the past few months. They've been a, 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 a very busy. Um, so it's not been the easiest to possibly get hold of them and, and ask them too many questions. I think that should be calming down a bit now. It should be a bit easier to contact them. And, and they're very good on, on their chat function and on the phone lines and, and whatnot. But we just thought we'd handle a couple of questions here tonight just to hopefully clear some bits up as to as to what they do and, and what you have to do with registering with them in order to comply with um, with GDPR. So one of the, the really, really common questions is, is it a legal requirement to register with the ICO? Yes, now this is complicated because the ICO was created under the Data Protection Act and you were required under the Data Protection Act to register with the ICO. But the Data Protection Act has now been superseded by GDPR, but you are still required to notify the ICO that you are a data controller and to pay the fee. So absolutely, I mean, I I have been registered with the ICO for many years and really, you know, I would argue that most handles should already have been registered with the ICO. But now with the GDPR requirement, you absolutely must um, notify them, uh, register with them and and pay the fee. Um, It's... uh, there's a very simple uh, kind of explanation of who needs to register with them. And there might be some exceptional circumstances where you don't need to, but there's a kind of, um, it's not quite a flow chart, but it's, it's, uh, there are questions like, uh, do you use computers for your data, etc.? And if you answer yes to these various questions, it will then tell you whether you need to register or not. It's a very low cost thing to have to do. It's just forty pounds if you're tier one, sixty pounds if you're tier two. Most landlords will be tier one, so um, you know it's not expensive. Better safe than sorry. Is the, the way we're we're kind of saying it. If you if there's any doubt in your mind that you you should be registered, then register. Sometimes people get indignant about paying these fees, don't they? And I just think it's important that we have this body doing this work for us in the UK. How would you feel if your identity was stolen? You know, uh, it's just only forty pounds, and that goes towards. Um, this organisation being able to operate, provide all the information that it provides us with. So, you know, I think it's important to be part of it. And they were, they're, to be, they were a really nice organisation, I have to say. They're, they're a very friendly, very friendly bunch, very helpful. Um, and they do, they're very, very useful with regards to if you've got any questions or if you've got any concerns. They're, they're very approachable. Mm. I've, I've certainly found we've, we've obviously been dealing with them a huge amount in, in the lead up to, to GDPR and querying marketing and, and all sorts of things and um, they've been nothing but helpful so it's certainly not an organisation to be scared of um, no, they're, they're definitely not. one to, 
I mean, you, you will appear on a public register. I think we're talking about that later, aren't we? But, um, you know, that's just part of the process, isn't it? So you, you mentioned that people needed to be registered under the Data Protection Act on the ICO. And we've had um, people saying, well, I was, I was registered before under the Data Protection Act. Um, obviously, there's been a huge flood of registrations, I would imagine, in the past few weeks. Um, but if you've already got a registration for the Data Protection Act, that, and they, the registrations last a year, um, so if you registered um, and you renewed, say, in January, um, is there a need to re-register um, in line with GDPR? Or? No, you absolutely don't need to. And in fact, I pay mine by direct debit, so it mm -hmm. just comes out every year. So if you're already registered, and I do recommend you put it onto direct debit, I think there was a discount as well for a while. If you did it online, it was a direct debit. Um, then it will just keep renewing annually. Um, and you, otherwise you can pay by um, debit card or check or whichever way you prefer to pay. It's, it's and it's all tax deductible, isn't it? Of so course, it's, yes, it's, it's you know, a legitimate expense. It's not likely to change with their Section 24 changes or anything. It's, uh, it's, no, it's I don't think so. <laughs> so, uh, and you, you touched on the questions that people are going to be asked. Um, they, they, do, they do ask some, some strange questions um, with regards to CCTV and things like that. But um, generally speaking... Could you, could you kind of run through the questions that you was asked when, when you registered? Yes, they ask things like what type of business are you? Are you a limited company or a sole trader? Um, it asks for your, uh, the application asks for your registered business details. Uh, who is responsible for handling data within the organisation? Because they will, of course, be the data controller. Um, whether you have policies and procedures in place. What type of data you collect and how you use it, and then obviously for payment details. So it's a kind of summary, really. Of so there's nothing that it's not like a test. They're not gonna they're not gonna check that you understand the principles of GDPR or anything like that. It is literally taking your registration details to to then obviously put you register you with the ICO. It's nothing. It's yes, nothing it's more just, than admin. It's a fairly simple form. Yes, yeah, nothing to be worried about. Yeah. No, no mm -hmm. tests or fit and proper person test or anything. No, and I mean, if, like if people are worried about relevant procedures and policies, what you need to talk about are things like, um, you know, uh, 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 that you keep data securely, that you um, only keep it for a certain amount of time, that you um, delete it after a certain amount of time. That well, you, all the policies that we've spoken about yes. tonight, really. Mm -hmm. The, is the stuff that you need, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and I think one of the, the, the final questions we're going to touch on is, um, obviously, you appear on the register. So that, that is, is publicly available information mm -hmm. that anybody can search. Um, and a lot of landlords, in particular, are concerned that their personal address will be available on this register. Um, is there any way around that? Well, um, I have an office address, actually, which is handy because I'm not very keen on putting my personal address just on these sort of registers, just in case I fall out with a tenant one day and they want to <laughs> throw a brick through my window. Um, so I try and... <laughs> I just might throw a brick through my office window, I suppose. Um, you know, that hasn't happened and I, I'm not expecting it to happen anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> yes. But um, so if you've got a business address, that's ideal. Um, you know, sometimes people use their accountant's address um, as their sort of business registration address, so you could use that as well. And I think you are even uh, allowed to have a PO box address as well, yes, yeah. yeah, so if you want to do that. Perfect. You so can. if you just want to kind of keep yourself to yourself, then there are options available to you, but obviously they may incur additional costs. Yes, that's right, yeah. No problem. I think we've, I think we've covered the sort of the frequently asked questions this evening. Um, obviously, I, I think plenty of you have been, been on live chat, having a, a chat with Kate tonight. Um, so what we'll do is any questions that have been covered on chat that we haven't actually answered in this evening's webinar, what we'll do is we'll pop those up on the Landlord University blog post over the next couple of days. Um, I'm sure there's, there's quite a few I'm being, being waved at, so they may take a while, but do bear with us. Um, and then the download for tonight will be available um, tomorrow on the Landlord University website and the NLA's YouTube channel. And of course, all of the information will be available in the membership section of your NLA um, account. 
the um, privacy policy, the fair processing policy and all that sort of thing. So if you are an NLA member, please do have a look in there. And if you're not, then do get in touch with the team or have a look online about potentially becoming a member because it is a really useful asset to have. So what remains to be said is thank you very much to Richard My uh, pleasure, for, for Polly, joining us tonight. Lovely to be working with you again. Thank talking you. Talking us through GDPR and hopefully you'll join us again very soon for another webinar. I'd love to, yes. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you.